Good evening. Welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Monica Valentine and I'm a program specialist here at the library. The Library of Congress is the world's largest library. Our collections include millions of books, films, newspapers, manuscript, ma excuse me, manuscripts, photographs, and more. We are home to the U.S. Copyright Office and home to the Congressional Research Service, which serves as the research arm for our country's lawmakers. Beyond that, we're sometimes referred to as the home of American creativity and culture. We look forward to all of you out here finding your place at the Library of Congress, whether that is as a visitor, a researcher, an intern, or creator. We want you to know that the Library of Congress is your library. So we're here tonight to talk about a historic event that's just one of the amazing stories reflected in our collections. In 1968, at the Olympics in Mexico City, two African-American athletes from San Jose State University, Dr. Tommy Smith and his teammate John Carlos, won the gold and bronze medals in the 200 meter sprint respectively. After their victory, they chose to use their moment on the Olympic medal stand for more than just themselves. They created one of the most iconic moments of protest in history, with each man raising a single fist wearing a black glove. That moment, meant to bring attention to racial injustice in the U.S. and South Africa, was captured by the media and made its way around the world. This moment lives on in the Library of Congress as part of our prints and photographs collection. John Carlo shared his story as a part of the Civil Rights History Project, a joint project of the library's American Folklife Center and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Dr. Smith has collaborated with award-winning New York Times best-selling author Derek Barnes and Emmy award-winning illustrator Dawood Anya Biwile to share his story in a graphic novel for young readers. This incredibly talented team has created Victory Stand, Raising My Fist for Justice. The book has been described as authentic, groundbreaking, and inspiring. It has recently also been long listed for the 2022 National Book Award. To help us understand the legacy of Dr. Smith and the making of Victory Stand, we welcome Ramunda Lark Young. Ramunda and her husband Derek are the co-owners and co-founders of Mahogany Books, which focuses on books written for, by, and about people of African descent. Known also as a community activist, Ramunda is a vice chair of the Prince William County Human Rights Commission and a gubernatorial appointee to the Council on Women in Virginia. In just a moment, I will turn the program over to our outstanding panel, and I encourage you all to pay close attention and consider any questions you might have for our guests about their experience or their work. We'll have 15 minutes for questions and answers near the end of the program. Raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question and wait for a staff member with a microphone so that we can all hear you. We will also um, collect questions in writing. Um, will you please help me welcome to the stage Ramunda Lark Young, Dawood Anya Biwile, Derek Barnes, and U.S. Olympic medalist and member of the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Hall of Fame, Dr. Tommy Smith. How are you all doing today? I'm excited. You guys excited? I mean excited history in the making um, to be here tonight is an honor so I am excited to be here and I hope you all are too <clears throat> uh, for Dr. Smith it is an honor to be here to listen to your story your experience that you shared the bravery that you exhibited that I don't know if I would have had back then um, but I'm just excited and honored to have this conversation with all of you and for Mr. Derek Barnes I appreciate you and the work that you do with black books for kids. Um, and Mr. Biwad, your illustrations are out of this world. So just to be up here with an Emmy award-winning illustrator, let's give it up for that, first of all. <laughs> Emmy. <clears throat> New York Times best-selling author, give it up for that. <laughs> and an Olympic gold medalist. So give it up for that. Too. And I really love this book um, for a lot of different reasons, so many reasons. I read it from cover to cover. And I love that a lot of times we see you in your journey 
and the icon iconic pose. But this book delves into so beautifully, Derek, yeah, you guys just knocked it out the park, but so beautifully into your history as a young person all through high school and even through college. And so I love that you all will get an opportunity to hear some of that perspective and to read some of that perspective when you get your copies of the book. Um, but we'll delve into a little bit. We won't give it all out. You guys are part of the VIP crew, I say, because this is the first kickoff event. Today is, and you all are here to witness that. So I'm excited. Give yourselves a big round of applause for making it out. <laughs> to be a part of this. So, so my qu big question is for, um, for you. I'll start with you, Derek. So as a kid's author, I want to kind of set the stage for people to kind of get to know who you are, all of you. But as a kid's author, could, you could have written about anything, any book, any experience in history. And you said yes to this book. Why was it important for you to say yes to this book? Well, it wasn't, uh, first of all, it's early in my uh, life when I started writing. It wasn't the same as me as a soldier. Um, you know, I, I feel like it, it felt right into my wheelhouse, right into my body of work. Um, 2017, my ninth book came out, and that was my first hit book. It was entitled Crown, and that was for the Press Cut. <laughs> but um, in 2016, um, I hadn't had a book out since 2010. Mm -hmm. So we had just moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I almost considered not even writing anymore, like just getting a regular job. And I was in the room that was, that's my office right now. There's no furniture, no uh, book stands, nothing. It was, it was just completely empty. But I was sitting there on the floor and I would write down notes about books that I, I, mean, I wrote like 30 books between 2010, 2017. And I was trying to write books to the gatekeepers in the publishing industry and nothing was happening for me. So I have, I have four boys. One of my boys came into the office that one day and he was eating an apple. I think he was around 11 years old. And he bit the apple and was chewing and he looked down at me and said, Daddy, you know what you should do? I said, what, Dad? You should write the blackest book ever. Mm. <laughs> He's like, you already not getting any book deals. Then he bit the apple and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, two weeks later, I wrote Crown and it was mm. a fresh cut. And he helped to remind me of who I was writing for. Instead of, I mean, for anybody that's watching, instead of trying to get your foot in the door, um, work on your voice. What are you trying to say? Think about your body of work and what kind of legacy you want to leave behind. So when I was offered the opportunity to write this book, it fit right into the lineage or the legacy that I want to leave behind. I mean, to be a part of this man's story, it, I, I couldn't turn it down. Absolutely. Couldn't turn it down. Absolutely. <clears throat> and if you all have not read Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Tell them, Derek, what's wrong with you? Get the book. You can get it at Mahogany Books, where my husband and I own, or any bookseller. Um, but it's a powerful book. One of the most awarded uh, children's books, I would say, in history that I've seen yes, so far. Yeah, it won like eight awards for that. So yeah. I, had, I had never won anything before. It had never been on his list. So I kept pushing, kept pushing forward, man, and uh, it's led me here today. Yeah. Sit next to this brother. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, Dr. Smith, I love this book, as I mentioned earlier, that it gives some backstory to who you were. And a lot of us don't know that backstory. We see the photo, but who are you as a person? So, my question for you is you went to great lengths sharing about your parents' journey as sharecroppers and moving place to place. Both of you, Derek, you guys Ella just wrote it out very beautifully, and, um, and it was just wonderful to read. But um, why was it important for you to give that in depth journey? giving that space in this book. Why was that important? Why did we need to know that? <clears throat> I am, thank you, for, thank you. Uh, it's good to see everybody. <laughs> uh, God is good, look at your smiling faces. It's, it, it's a pleasure. I'm one of 12. Mm -hmm. Seven girls, Lord have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> and five boys. Uh, born in the backwoods of Texas, Texarkana, Texas, moved to California in the early 50s on a labor camp, came to California where the, these, some of these uh, Western foreigners, Western sharecroppers brought us in to California to work on their farms, put us on labor camps. And we had to work uh, diligently 
night and day just to pay the people who brought us here to work, work brought us to California to work on the farms. And I never, never talk very much. I mean, you have seven sisters, you don't have any space to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but I always wanted to talk, but I never grew into the idea of maybe you will have a word someday and maybe you could do something with it. So I was blessed with speed because I had seven sisters, you know, to stay away from me. <laughs> I was blessed with speed to, to, to move around and to use it some way, but I didn't know how. You can't run races in cotton fields. You know, you have to pick the cotton first to make space. Well, I had one sister, Sally, who was right over me. She was faster than me. Sally was built like Tarzan, you know, and I got many beats from Sally because I could beat her, and she knew I could beat her in any race. <laughs> now, I'm talking about childhood now, little, little guys, uh, age seven and eight. But I never would beat her because if I beat her in a race, She'd beat me physically for beating her in the race. So I always was a close second. But I grew into understanding winning because I never could. And I promised my, myself, myself, thank you. I promised myself that if I ever beat Sally, I'm going to beat everybody else I run against. And so I just kept at it, kept at it, kept working, kept working. And one day at school, the principal called us out to race. And I beat Sally for the first time. Sally couldn't beat me up because I beat her because the principal was there. So uh, after I crossed the finish line, everything was great. I watched him cross, you know, all of them first. And I was smiling. I saw Sally <laughs> face because I knew I was going to get beat. She reached in the pocket. I was ducking and diving. And she came out with a nickel. A nickel, folks. She gave me the nickel. I became a professional athlete in the fourth grade because she gave me that nickel. Mm -hmm. And she said, Tommy, you take this and you spend it any way you want to. Now, anybody who's old enough to know what a nickel was back in the 50s knew that was some money. <laughs> I bought me all the candy I could. And I ate it. All the candy I bought, I ate it. Anyway, I know that's, that's, that's superfluous here. But I wanted to be something. And I knew if I had the ability to do something, I wanted to share it with the rest of the world. I wanted to be a glow in the light of lives. And uh, I went on to grammar school, high school, or college. I majored in sociology with a minor in uh, physical education and, and military science. Can you believe that? <laughs> military science. Oh, I was a good first lieutenant. Anyway, that's another whole story. But that's how Tommy made his background. And from that, I built a bridge. And I heard my wife grunt, so I know I'm going to shut up and keep on moving. <laughs> no, but I, I love that you included that story in the book, that you and Derek made sure that that was there. Yeah. And people got a sense of who you were and the relationships that you had with your sisters um, and your family. So I love that people get that kind of inside bird's eye view of, of who you are and what challenged you and what made you really strive to go for what you went for. Um, my question next for, is for you, Derek. So I love that you started with Dr. Smith's childhood all the way up <clears throat> to the post-Olympic medal. What struck you most about his childhood story? So he talked about it a little bit, but what struck you most as you were writing this about it? Uh, well, in fact, there was so many of them, but that is kind of common. You think about families in the, in the South, black families in the South during that era in the 40s and 50s, but it was so close-knit. Like, you know, one of the lines in the book is like, we, we, didn't, we didn't have a lot, but we had plenty because we had each other, you know. Um, no running water, no plumbing, no, he, he didn't see a cement sidewalk until he went to college, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, they had each other and they worked in the fields together. And this was a family unit. And this is where he learned and, and got his work ethic from, mm -hmm. watching his father. Uh, you know, another line in the book, his father was Superman before he knew who Superman was. And um, I, I really tried to structure the story centered around that, those 19 seconds that it, it took him to win that race. And I kind of broke up the whole book um, and stretched those 19 seconds out. And every time he took a turn, when, when I sat down and talked to him when I came to your house, I had never talked to a track and field athlete before about, and he really looked at track and field from a scientific uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, like his body was a, a Ferrari. So, you know, what percentage to decelerate, to accelerate, when you go around, you know, 
sense of turn and running in 200 meters. I had never had that conversation before. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I did not know before I did research on him is that he injured himself during the race prior to the final. So mm -hmm. he right. should not have been able to run this race. But he knew how, first of all, God was with him that day. Mm. You know, the fact that he won, won that race and, and he was injured and to be on that number one podium. Like, just think if he had finished in fourth place, even in third place, but he finished first place, his fifth rose the highest, mm -hmm. you know, be because of that uh, uh, race. So I, I, I found out so many things I did not know about him, but, uh, you know, his relationship with his family really touched me because I have, I have, I don't have 12 kids, but uh, <laughs> it really uh, touched me, you know, the fact that you don't need much, but if you have family to support you and lift you up, you know, his sister Sally, she she came to all your events yes, she in did. high school. I mean, when nobody else would show up, she was there. Mm -hmm. Family, family is everything. And uh, I learned a lot about studying, you know, the uh, Smith family. Yeah. You're definitely close with your boys. You talk about your boys yeah. and your amazing wife often, which is always a, a beautiful thing to see and to hear, really. I don't know if we see a lot of that in our community as much as I would love to see yeah. for a lot of different reasons sometimes. Um, so we have this um, um, Emmy award-winning illustrator down here that's low-key chilling with us, um, but amazing, amazing work. And so my question for you, Dawood, is please share a particular part of the book that you were extremely eager to illustrate because of the actual scene um, before you. And if there was a scene that really sticks out, can you describe that scene? And you guys, I wish we had a big projector so you all could see the work that this amazing yeah. illustrator did. You'll see it in your books, but the expressions, the joy, the pain, you, it's all in these faces that you so beautifully um, illustrated. So what would be one of those um, scenes that you were excited um, to do? And did you read the book first? Did you have the script first? And you uh, and went from yeah, there, correct? Yeah, <coughs> yeah I've always, I always go through the script sure. at least twice. I'll, I'll read it twice. And then, uh, you know, I'll have conversations with Derek, and he'll even help me out with, like, um, things that he may visualize, like some reference. And then Dr. Smith, uh, ironically, he, he lived, in, like, in, in the vicinity of where I live down in Georgia. So I got a chance to stop by his house and talk to him, and he was actually showing me some of his, uh, some of his work from his archives, photos and things like that, actual gold medal things like that, but that I never laid my eyes on before. So all that helped to spark uh, these visions in my mind. In terms of like a specific scene, it's really hard to say because there were so many different scenes that I wanted to tackle from reading it. I think one that, for me, one that stood, stood out was the, um, when he was explaining uh, the era of time, you know, with the lynchings and mm -hmm. things of that nature, which for a lot of us is, is unfathomable. Like we don't, we don't see it, it doesn't exist anymore. And a lot of those remnants have basically been eradicated where, you know, there might be a, a Walmart where there were trees where people were lynched and, and things like that. So we're kind of resurrecting that, that feeling. And um, so I think getting to that scene was, it was a powerful uh, two page spread. And, I, and you know, I kind of envisioned it in my mind um, you know, just from growing up and my father having a lot of books on lynchings and um, hidden histories of America and, and things like that. And we grew up in Philadelphia, so that, that was the, the birthplace. So there was like a lot of iconic things just in our neighborhood growing up. So, um, so I had a perspective coming to it um, that I couldn't wait to get to. And then there were other, other things, so that's kind of more the dramatic side but also the, the tender moments of the family and the children, because I, I like doing things for family uh, and, and children as well, so that just those communal shots, they're not action shots, but they're just tender moments, mm -hmm. you know, between him and his father, or him and his mother, or the father and mother, how they relate, or how all the children relate. You know, I like getting into that and then feeling like I'm there. You know, so so I say it, it's really hard to say. There, there's so many scenes. So many. There mm -hmm. really were. There really were. But that one about the lynching was a very poignant one. That I just looked at that, and there was so many different things happening on that page. Um, but it just really struck me the detail 
and the care that you took in showing that. Um, it, was, it was crazy, to be honest, just to see that. Well, I also, oh, I, I'm sorry. Mm -mm. Uh, I also think uh, cinematic, because I do storyboards for film and television. Uh, I've been doing graphic novels and comic books for years. Um, so I've worked on a lot of movies and things like that. So when I work on these scenes, even though I'm resurrecting these ideas and, and feelings, I also think about it thematically, like, you know, how can you make this dynamic? You know, even if this, it's a family scene and we're just sitting there, it's a tender moment, how's the camera going to, how's the lighting? You know, you gotta make it epic. You know, so I think of it like this is a, the movie and then I just, I, I illustrate it like a storyboard. Mm -hmm. Love it, love it, love it. And everybody will too as you open up the pages and see it for yourselves. Uh, my next question, next question is for you, Derek. Um, I'm sorry, for Mr. Smith. So there was one powerful exchange. You talked about your um, race with your sister, Sally. And there was an exchange that served as the motivation for the rest of your life. That's on the page. This incident served for um, just the catalyst for you. And it's on page 78. And it says, it, after you just ran the race against your sister, Sally, and won, let me say and won, that's it. He made clear that we knew that he won that race. Um, but he said, your dad says, Tommy, if I ever find out <laughs> that you finished second place, it's over and you'll be back here working in these fields with us. Why did that linger with you as an adult? You mentioned that it, it struck with, stuck with you from then even to this day. Why did not going back and working at the labor camps as you mentioned really struck you? Daddy always told his kids, when you grow up, he want us to be somebody because he didn't see himself uh, a person at that particular time that would do us any good by keeping us in the fields. Although he needed us in the fields because we made three dollars a hundred for picking cotton, which took us about four hours to get a hundred pounds, you know. So that was a lot of money back then. But we needed all the kids in the field. Mm -hmm. And you see all the kids in the field, and he's looking around and saying, "Work," and we thought that was a triumph work that was it we were glad to have a job although it was in the primer stage of making money but it was money we needed <clears throat> one day this was a turning point in my life one day the principal of the school told sally who was in the seventh grade and i was in the fourth grade to uh have a race because they were going to bakersfield california for an aau meet some of you people know what the aau meet was back in those days and uh, well, I said, Daddy, Daddy is Madagascar background, you know, big chest, slanted eyes, red eyes, by the way, dark. And he looked at me, he said, tell me what you want. Uh, I said, Mr. Fouth, F-O-C-T-H, F-O-C-H-T was the principal's name, wants uh, me to go to Bakersfield and run in a meet. He was in the hog pen, y'all, feeding the hogs, okay? And he stood up. I said, oh, Lord, I'm, I'm going to get a whooping. <laughs> he said, uh, no, well, tell me, you know, you, we need everybody in the field to work. We need the money. And he bent back over, then he stood up again. And I said, that's two whoopings. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said, now, I'm going to let you go this weekend. But if you lose, you'll be out in the field next weekend with the rest of your brothers and sisters. You know, you know I didn't lose race. You know I didn't lose that race. I would have tripped somebody first <laughs> before oh, I lost that right. race. I won the race in the crowd stands because nobody ever seen this long-legged, five feet seven, I guess, or eight, maybe 118-pound guy run that fast and knees that high. So I ran the race and came back to Daddy, and he didn't say nothing. It was Sally the one that said, "Tell me how'd you do?" I said, "I won." She said, "I know that." And Daddy, from then on, said, well, boy, you know, uh, you're doing pretty good. Just keep on going. But what was the epitaph and a great one of that race in Mexico City? Daddy had never seen me run his life. Never. I ran a plethora of races. No, my mother, they were busy working and raising kids. Mm -hmm. And my background, you know, was helping. I was seven, so I changed diapers of the younger kids because there was five after me. And got whooped in, got beat up by the older kids. So I was up, my neck was on swivel all the time. So at, at Mexico, I went to Mexico City, I went back down home to, to uh, San Jose State and Fresno, California, if you know, uh, the, the, the 190 miles. I went back down, he was feeding the hogs, a new set of hogs, by the way. 
and uh, he he raised up out of the, uh, uh, the hog pen again, and he said, "Boy, you know uh, some of these people around here saying you did something bad." He didn't know he couldn't read. Mm. He didn't know where I was or what I was doing. I said, "Well, Dad, I ran a race." He said, "Hot no, boy, you still running?" <laughs> I said, "Yes, sir." <laughs> And that's how it went from then on. I won a race, but my mother, uh, she received feces in the mailbox. She received bad letters in the mailbox. She died at age 57 because of all the stress uh, of what had happened uh, uh, because uh, I went to Mexico City and made a world statement of faith and not hate. I was raised in a family. My dad had respected people, took us to church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I, it was something I felt needed doing and it wasn't just Tommy, it was a whole track team. And many track teams joined, even the Harvard rowing team came in with us because it wasn't a black right thing. It was a human right, which included everyone. I, I mm -hmm. talk, I better get off here. <laughs> and, uh, no, it's, but it's right it's here. Good. No, 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 but it's important, I think, and it leads really into my next question when you say what happened to your mom and receiving yeah. feces in the mail for a, a, a silent protest, really silent. Protest. And my question then leads me to Derek. You know, the story is one that is really layered with so many different facets, right? We've talked about some. And as most black people's lives are, <clears throat> one of those things that sticks out to me um, is the reality of being in the prime of our winningest moment, winningest, as him, Mr. Uh, Smith mentioned, standing up there, winningest moments. And not just even as an illustrator, you have those winning moments. And, but you're still being relegated um, to being reminded of our blackness in those situations our humanity. And so have you ever experienced that as an illustrator, as a writer, that you are reminded, it doesn't matter if you won an Emmy, if it doesn't matter if you've been on the New York Times list, it doesn't matter if you won an Olympic medal. It is there that you really are reminded of who you are versus the things that you were doing at that moment. Have you ever been experienced those? And if so, can you share? Oh, you want me to go? Okay. Either one. Oh, Both. yeah. No, I mean, um, <laughs> well, I guess with me, like the way I was raised, you know, my father, he, <coughs> um, you know, he's since passed on, him and my mother. But uh, my father wrote books on the black family since the early 70s. He wrote one of the first books on Kwanzaa and, you know, before people were even utilizing it uh, back in the early 70s. So since we were young, he always had us be aware of self, who we are, <laughs> you know, understanding our history. And, uh, and that's how I was aware of you, <laughs> Dr. Smith. When I was young, it was because my, my dad had that poster, mm -hmm. you know, all that. And those images were always around us. And so I never really went into the world thinking in terms of, like, I needed validation. Mm -hmm. You know, we had self-validation in the home. Me and my brothers and my mom was a creative person. Um, so my, and my dad was a researcher. So I had that balance of, of him saying, hey, you know, whatever you do, go out, you know, own what you create, um, you know, know who you are. And with my mom, it was like whatever you create, you know, she, she actually, she was a musician, so she always connected me, uh, helped me to understand the connection between music and art and classical music, um, classic soul, hip hop, all that stuff, how it all merged, and how it all was a part of us. So when I went to the world, like when I get awards and things like that, I always look at it like, that's like somebody patting you on the back saying, oh, that's good job, keep going. But I never looked at it as, this is my arrival, this is what made me. I look at it like, it's something that adds to, to my, you know, it adds to my value in terms of how other people see me. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, I already know what my value is. So I'm never fooled when I'm in a situation where somebody wants to treat me as how they see a black man you know, or how they see um, how we should be portrayed because I don't go for that. It's like, I already know who I am. I, and if somebody, I take people on their own merit because mm -hmm. I too am a, am, am a humanitarian. I take anybody on their own merit, but I'm not a clown either where if somebody wants to try to say I'm not something or I don't have a value, then I'll be like, you know, th then you just missed out on what I have to offer, mm -hmm. but I'm no less, no less than, and that's what I teach my sons, and even young kids, you know, I always speak at schools and things like that, and I always try to get them to understand their, their value, 
and not to worry about what other people place on you. Mm -hmm. And then all the things that you will see, such as the gold medal and the, the honor, honorings and the awards and all those things, those add to our intrinsic values in terms of how people, how other people see us. But we understand that our greatness within and how um, uh, far reaching that is. Right, powerful, powerful. Did you want to add anything to that, Mr. Barnes? Or no? no oh yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of along the same yeah. lines as Brother Dawood, he, but he is a little bit more modest than me. <laughs> like, I want to win every damn thing, <laughs> everything. And it's not from, I mean, I, I'm a, a very competitive person, but like when I first got into this business, into children's publishing, I wasn't made aware of all the, you know, the large awards like the, you know, Coretta Scott King, Newberry, and Prince, you know. So once I got a taste of that and I saw what it does to that book, like it, 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 it makes that book far reaching across the planet. Mm -hmm. So I'm extremely, extremely competitive person, but I understand that I, I write for all children, but I write to black children. Mm -hmm. And if I create a book with a beautiful black child as a protagonist and I win an award, that book is everywhere. So the whole world has no mm -hmm. choice but to see how beautiful and brilliant this baby is. Right. You know, but yeah, I wanna win everything. <laughs> I wanna win Emmys and Oscars. I wanna win bowling trophies, everything. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of person I am. Mm -hmm. Because we put so much into this work, man. We put so much into this work. I, I, was, I was talking to an artist you know, last week, and we were talking about when you purchase these books, like you're not just purchasing yeah. the story, but you're purchasing like months out of our lives, mm -hmm. like a year or so out of our lives. So we put so much into it, and and uh, it's, it's it's not so much that we, you know, you know, just like you were saying, that I don't I don't measure my work by these uh, by these awards, mm -hmm. but you're gonna see me. <laughs> you're gonna see me. I know that's it, right. We'll be looking for that bowling trophy. Yeah. <laughs> Post it on social media. We'll look. So let's set the stage, right? So, Dr. Smith, you are 24 years old. It's the evening of October 16, 1968. You're at the starting blocks of the 200 meter run. You hunch down, the shot spires, and you're off, right? <clears throat> oh. You run your fastest rate, race yet, clocking in at 19.83 seconds, a world record. And then after that, you put on your track suit, you walk to the podium to receive your gold medal. My question for you is, as you were walking to the podium, what was going on through your mind at that very moment as you're walking up? Because you've already thought perhaps, um, you have your glove with you, you have your no shoes on, you have all these things, we'll ask that question as well, but what was going through your mind? If you had just made this, um, world record and you're walking up to the podium to take your medal. What were you thinking? Got to get across the track, not around it. I have to get across it. I've been around it. This is this electric shock is going through the brain. Atomize what I have to do. Like don't fall on lane three because that's where you ran the race. <laughs> Walk across it with pride. We had, of course, the black socks, my Sunday socks, by the way. Mm. Uh, uh, the black gloves, we had, I had a scarf around my neck, and I had a lot to say, but I had no time to say it. That's why I call it silent gesture. Uh, in my mind, I'm a Gemini, so my mind took off, went someplace else. I saw, I think it was this family out front, and uh, the lady said, hi. And I turned around, I wanted to, so bad to stop and take a picture, but I, I'm sorry, I couldn't, <laughs> I, was in, I was in a hurry. Uh, uh, and and <clears throat> I knew I had a message. As they called my name and I stepped up on the victory stand, that was my whole life. That one giant step. And you've heard that before, haven't you? One giant step for man. You've heard that before? Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. Way up high. And I stood there and my automatically my hands went up. Now, this is history for me. I'm a 24-year-old skinny kid, broke, mm -hmm. no college education yet. Mm -hmm. That's another story now. Mm -hmm. And I had something to say and couldn't say it. Because I was a docile kid, but I had a lot to say. Because when I was on the track training, I couldn't talk to anybody. If it wasn't to about Coach Bud Winter about the science of speed, and which I had. So there I was, locked into 
the minds of America. In fact, the whole entire world. Mm-hmm. And just, they hung the medal around my neck. Uh, I've stood there proud. I know the flag was coming up, which I'm also proud of now. Why am I proud of it? Not because of that it was representing hate. I had a lot of my people die in making America what it is. So why am I going to hate something which they fought for? Who are Tommy Smith to, 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 to negatively display idiocy because of racist America? And the flag, it was pride to me. Return. Now, I said I was ROTC, remember? Mm-hmm. I turned with the military return. If you ever see that, 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 that pose again, or even the, 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 the motion picture of it, you'll see that military right turn. I was sweet, boy! <laughs> I mean, I was sweet, you know? <laughs> 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 I turned real quick. And flat, the Star Spangled Banner started playing, and the chill was in my body. And you notice when that right arm went up, Everything was still, masterfully still. Head bowed. Lord, prayer, come on now. Mm-hmm. I prayed the entire song. One minute and 30 seconds. When it was finished, notice they're on, what they're on. They didn't flop down. It came down with power and pride. And then I did my left turn, left turn. Boop, <laughs> oh, boy, I was sweet. Turned left. And I, I talking like this, but it was more serious than this. I just get a magical feeling when I talk about it because it, it's down there. I can feel it. Whew. And then I said, well, it's over. Mm-hmm. See, my life had been threatened several times before I left San Jose to go to Mexico. My wife's, I was married at that time, 24 years old. Life was threatened in San Jose. And I was practicing for Mexico games. That was the end of the chapter. That book, that was it. A lot of us here. And these young guys right here are masterful minds, I tell you. You notice they're different, but they're so much alike in their professions. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm proud to work with them because they can tell the story. I mean, it's all here. It's here. Itemized directly. No fat on it. It's all down the line. All the skinny. <laughs> yeah, and I'm off the subject now, so I'll hush again. No, no, no. <laughs> so my, my other question, and a lot of people ask, you know, want to know the backlash. You talked about it a little bit, but what was some of that backlash you faced when you made this silent protest? That's part one. And then part two, what would you, and you may have already said, we think of Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick right now, who also made a silent protest. Have you talked to him, and what you know, what were you, if you did talk to him, what have you said to him, number one? And then two, what was the backlash that you faced? Because we've seen the backlash that Colin faced and is still facing, no matter whatever, settlement or whatever happened, the years of, of dealing with that backlash. Yeah. And so what was that backlash for you and what words have you shared with him, if any? I don't want to assume, but Yeah, maybe. right. Even before we left to go, to go to the Olympic Games in Mexico City, uh, my life had been threatened several times. Uh, uh, and I, I didn't know what to do about it uh, because I was on an Olympic team. It was called the Olympic Project for Human Rights, so there were other athletes also involved. The Olympic Project for Human Rights, an old umbrella, started at San Jose State University, and I was a student. In fact, I was on the board that started the Olympic Project for Human Rights, so I had to be very particular of what I was doing, how I was saying it, have respect for who I was talking to all the time because you're human. No matter what color you are, you still got the same responsibility as everybody else. We would just mention more than the white folks. But I use that freely because you should got to hear the truth. Don't try to hide something that uh, you, you know that uh, it's going to get you in trouble later on. So, so, so the merciful thing about the Olympic Project for Human Rights, that there were other countries, and I think I just said this, I'm re- beginning to repeat myself now. There were other countries, athletes uh, from other countries understood what we were saying, especially the, the, the countries of color. But there was also, I said, Harvard team, because it was a human rights issue, not a black rights issue. Human rights issue, the blacks is a part of it. So that was our battle, that was our fight. And he's 24 years old, I recognize this from being a part of the system and not being recognized for who I was, not how fast I ran. How fast I ran was a platform <coughs> for me to say my pride in who I was and how much we needed America to come together in any strife there might be. Okay. 
uh, and, and in Hebrews, of course, we, we, Hebrew 11 and 1 will tell you this about faith and about the goodness of it and bringing together the faces of those who believe in themselves. Young and you students, especially you students, I see all, I see you the students around. You got to start believing in yourself now. You can't be on mom and daddy all your life. Right now, I know you're a refrigerator at ramparts, but you got you to understand that. You're going to be closed one day. And you're going to wonder, what happened to me? I can't go in there and get no free milk. No, no, no more free milk. Now I'm off again. Go ahead. But I, I, I like to get off. I was going to ask well, you too, Jerry. Go ahead. I was say also people don't realize that that race was his last race. Mm-hmm. You don't think about that. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> that was his <laughs> last race. Powerful. Yeah, yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 you had, I don't know if you had thought about um, going to the, uh, what was that, the 72 Olympics? 72 games, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have your mind set on, oh, I'm but I mean, never race again at 24. And how, and how young of a man are you now? I don't, I don't, I don't know if they know that. Watch it. <laughs> <laughs> own it, own to, it, Dr. Smith, I'm trying to give them some context. Oh, yeah, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very proud of it, yeah. yeah. Very proud of it. Uh, uh, duh. Uh, <laughs> s- 78 years old. 78, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I can still hit a little bit too. I know it. You know, I yeah. know it. <laughs> you know, you give me my crutch, I can go on out there and do it. Yes. <laughs> uh, boy, if I had a brain, I'd be able to think. I, so many things are running through my mind now. Well, it, 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 she was asking me about like what actually happened after the race. Like, he wasn't, wasn't able to get a job in a lot of different mm-hmm. places. First of all, I was kicked off the team. Kicked off the team. Um, Sent me home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was afraid to go to class because as soon as I got home, uh, a, a, a rock sailed through my window, broke my window, was on it, said, use the N-word on it, you will die at 1.30 tomorrow. I should have kept it, and should have kept the rock too, but you know, at that particular time, I, I wasn't thinking about being important. I was thinking about my, my, my grades because I hadn't graduated from college yet. You know, I needed that degree. Uh, so that I went to college with it. at night. I was afraid to go to college during the day because uh, I was afraid somebody would shoot me. And it w- I wasn't far off in that thinking because uh, uh, I had received death threats. You know, you know receiving something like that is, is unimaginable almost to me. It was then. I kind of looked at it and kind of just kind of threw the paper on, on the dresser, the one I didn't have. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I just, things that I remember, I just should have on to them, but I didn't go to Mexico to do that to be great. I went to Mexico to win the Olympic game, win it, and then make a statement, then go home, finish my education, get a job, go to church, marry, and die. And here you sit. Here I sit. Here you are on the cover of this book. Isn't that something? Here we are listening to your story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just an honor to hear it from yeah. your mouth and to read it on these pages. And as I started out earlier at the beginning, I don't know if I would have had that courage to even do it. You, there was some kind of premeditation in my mind there to have that glove, to put that scarf around your neck. So there was a lot of things there, but to have that type of bravery, I just wish that upon all of us. And there's young people, as you mentioned here in the audience, that are facing yeah. things all the time. There's older people in the audience facing things all the time, but that bravery that you exhibited there, even a silent protest and all the things that you went through for all these years that you've endured and still have the same positive energy outlook that you have is unfathomable. So just, I wanna give a big round of applause for that, just to have that energy. Well, thank you all, thank you all. Thank you. Um, my, my last question here before we open it up for Q&A really quickly is, so Derek, I want to end it with you as well. So you're an author of 11 books, is it? How many books? I think six. And you six, say 50? Yeah, six, 16. Yeah. Oh, okay, 16. Yeah. Okay, 16 books. And so right now we're having this discussion during Banned Book Week, nationally recognized Banned Book Week, where many authors' works are being censored. Schools around the country are challenging and banning books because of facts. There's plenty of facts in this book here because of facts that were shared. Um, and there's certain parents yeah. and leaders who are not you know, open to reading tons of books, whether it's Toni Morrison, whether it's The Kafir Boy, whether it's Monster by Dean Myers, lots of books that are out there that are being banned. And so my question for you is, 
What are your thoughts around that? Are, is there any fear of this book being banned? No, I think. I mean, because there's lots of amazing facts in here that people need to see and people need to read well, about. You, but I don't know what people's feelings are. The book is not out yet. So. Well, you know, just harkening back to, you know, what Brother Solo told me, make mm -hmm. the blackest book you possibly can. I, I had a meeting with um, a consortium of popular black children book authors and illustrators. That was my message to them. Keep moving forward, mm -hmm. keep cranking these books out. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, I'm, 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 I'm very big on lineage and artists that came before me. Uh, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, and um, there's this 19 foot statue of Charlie Parker right behind the Negro League Baseball Museum. Every time I go home, no matter what time it is, I sit out there and talk to Brother Charlie mm -hmm. and just say thank you. And, I'm, and I, I have the baton and to use a track reference and we, we can't allow these book bans to keep us from telling the truth. What kind of society, I mean, there hasn't been one society in human history that has succeeded by banning books at all. And we can't allow that to uh, make us fearful. I, I'm not gonna change my story. I'm not gonna change my content. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna ramp it up. Oh. <laughs> ramp it up, we have to. I mean, we. We have an obligation, just like I, I feel like I have an obligation to those that came before me. I have an obligation to my children, to these children, to, to, to children not only in this country, but we, we have an obligation to tell the truth about American history. And uh, I want to keep doing that. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you. We're at Mahogany Books, we'll keep selling it. So I love it. You know, because our customers need it. Mm -hmm. um, we desire it, we need it as well, so thank you. But I just want to say thank you to each of you for sharing your gifts for your, sharing your talents, for sharing this amazing story. And um, I'm just excited for the world to read it too. So we'll open it up for questions and answers. Sure. Yes, in the beautiful green dress. Mm -hmm. This was simply a phenomenal panel. I have not been able to get off the edge of my seat. And just um, thinking about everyone who would have just have lived and died if it weren't for the moment that you took um, to pay homage uh, you know, my, I'm a third generation or fourth generation uh, descendant of American slavery. Uh, we recently visited the plantation where my grandmother's grandmother freed herself from, it was an Emancipation Proclamation, she freed herself from Kent's Island. Um, and, and, I, and as I drive there often, I think about the large body of water that separates that land or that island from the rest of Annapolis where the military was and Excuse me, I'll be able to just prepare these remarks. Um, I think about that body of water and what it would take to prepare to try to cross that body of water into freeing yourself. Um, and let alone to see now years later, people like you taking a stand for people that um, were a part of your family, but people that were a part of families that you didn't even know. Um, and so I've spent really the last five years or so uh, trying to discover my family's lineage, um, trying to discover where was our family dismantled, trying to discover why was there systemic removal, the understanding the systemic removal of fathers from families and how you, the difference it made for you to have your father, to have your mom and to have the foundation that many people today who want to have a voice, who want to speak up, and, and I often coach those youth um, in the inner city, um, they don't have that same stability. Um, they don't have the foundation to stand on with experiencing um, sort of, it's, it's the prejudice today is more internal um, in the black community and, and even amongst those of us who have risen to leadership, uh, whereas they're in, inadvertently hating each other now, whereas one point we were standing together. We were taking victory stands together. So I'm curious to know, was the same hatred coming from people who were of non-descendant of color, or, or did you receive that same backlash coming from black people who felt like, you know, you a sense of entitlement that you took, or maybe they wanted to take the stand that they didn't have a chance to take? And how did you deal with that? Because that is one of the, I think, it's one of the greatest challenges right now. If we do not find a way to show up and stand together, in numbers for whatever the future holds and to really restore our families, the foundation of what we should be building on. And I'm working on that for the future myself. 
but that's another story. Um, but how did you deal with external backlash and internal backlash from people who looked like you, who didn't believe that you should have a voice, who didn't believe that you should take a stand, um, but, but, but knew that it was necessary for you to do that? No, that, 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 that's a question, huh? Um, I mean, it's, I it's, so many you know, I, can, I can tell that, I can tell <laughs> that. You have a whole history of, 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 of questions. And for me, it was both sides. I, I dealt with the, the in individuals, you know, who came to me with the uh, uh, guys. I know you have something to say about this, too, so I'll make it very, very short. Came to me with the different problems of how we could do. And you can't stop. You must continue. I don't have a direct answer, but you should continue and rely on faith. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, but without what? Works. Faith is dead. So you can't lie. Your inside problems on what other people think. They're going to think it anyway. You're going to be hated anyway. Yes, by some, some by your own folks. You're going to be hated because they have their way of doing things. But this was my way on the victory stand to show or to prove or to excite or to give back. You have your ways. You all have your ways. You bet, but, but you haven't had a chance to do it yet. Some of you have and think it's enough, but you're here to continue to do what you do. Don't die on the vine. No matter what your age is, don't die on the vine. Do what you believe is necessary to cultivate an entity called S-E-L-F. Look in the mirror and you might see it. You just might. So that, that's about as far as I can go into you, you, the, the, the drama and this drama, what you were just talking about, believe in yourself because silence is not an option. You must speak up. How many times, I'm going to quit now. How many times have you been in a conversation and didn't say anything? And as soon as the conversation was over, you started saying something. I should have said something. I, you know, you were wrong. No, you hush because you had your chance. You didn't say anything. Silence is not an option. Speak up. Youngin, speak up. <laughs> okay? Yeah. I'm through now. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Question up here. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I didn't know when I started this day that I would be in the same Oops. room as you can understand a legend. Can you understand? Do you mind, I can take my mask off. Yeah, yeah, we can understand. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I actually teach history, and I have taught sports history before, and of course, shared your story. What, and, and this is to community college students, so often first generation students, um, students who have had traditionally disadvantaged backgrounds. And what advice would you give to them that I could pass on to them from the Olympic legend himself who feel that they don't have a voice and you might have just answered it, but um, what would you suggest to them who, who don't feel that they have that space, they don't have that Olympic podium to, to make that silent gesture? You know, actually they do have a podium, it's not as big as mine. You get up in the morning, that's your podium. Mm -hmm. You go in the bathroom and you're gonna really have a podium if you didn't have a good night last night, you know. <laughs> you, you know, whatever, wherever you are, you make something happen. What did John Lewis say, you know, there's some make bad trouble, good trouble, some of what? Trouble. Good trouble. Yeah, you know, it's going to always trouble. be trouble. Necessary yeah. trouble. Always be trouble. Don't feel sorry for yourself just because somebody didn't blow a horn in, in your behalf. Self, S-E-L-F. Get up and be rejoiced that you got a voice. Also, uh, also to that point, I mean, I thought that this would be, uh, his, his life story is the perfect subject for a children's book. Mm -hmm. And the first chapter I entitled A Country Boy. Because when I first sat and met with him, I was very excited, first of all, just just pulling up in y'all's driveway. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went down to his man cave, it's like a museum. It was fan art and there was trophies and every prominent American figure you can think of a picture of him, him and his beautiful wife with this person. So I was kind of nervous when I sat down. I was thinking like this brother's probably tired of telling this story, mm. but he was so ex he was he had the same amount of energy, that, like he probably told it the first time. And the more he talked, the more comfortable I felt in his presence. Like he 
to be my father or be my uncle. And when I found out more about him and him being from Texas, being a part of this large family, and I said, man, he's just a, he's a country boy from Texas, man. <laughs> but that is so important because you don't have to be from some famous civil rights right. family. You don't have to be from wealth. All you have to do is recognize that there's a problem in my space. Somebody's not being treated properly. I need to say something. I need to do something. It could be on your block. It could be in your classroom. It could be in your city. Educate yourself. That is the most primary thing we can do, especially when you're talking about the youth and all these book bands. Educate yourself about the history of your people, about America, about your neighborhood, and just speak up and say something. You know, and the fact that I feel like we were all given and, and, and blessed with a multitude of gifts. He was, uh, you know, amongst the many gifts that he has, he was given the gift of speed. And I talk to my sons all the time about what our, um, what our blessings and, and, and gifts are. It's not about that primary thing. I was given the gift to write and to you know, manipulate the English language, but that's not where I am. I, I, I need to utilize that. God said use that to <laughs> touch people. He was given the gift of speed. Again, he, he won that race. The fact that he was on that number one stand and he overcame that injury. You know, he used his speed to connect with people. So whatever your gifts are, and I'm not just talking to the kids, whatever your gifts are, use them to connect people, to help people, to, to try to change where you live, to try to change this country to make it a better place. No matter what it is, you might be a good listener. You might, you might make a good, uh, a good potato salad. It ain't about the potato salad, it's about the people that gather around your mm. potato salad. It's gonna have a conversation. So use whatever God has blessed you with in order to make this world a better place. And I thank God for you winning that race. Absolutely. <laughs> There you go. Hey, round <laughs> the of perfect potato picture book, right? <laughs> Question. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smith, thank you for um, writing this book and, and taking opportunities to share your story. But other people have also tried to share your story. Academic books have been written, documentaries, and other authors have written about your experience, your life, and tried to make sense of what it means. Is there anything that they've gotten wrong or, or something that you want to correct that's become part of our popular uh, memory of, of uh, your history? You know, what, what they have said came from them, their hearts, and even if it's a lie, and I'm not there, I read about it, it's them that said it. And I know that the lie can ruin anybody's uh, uh, soup, uh, uh, a bowl of gravy, but a lot of people still eat it. So. What I'm saying, I, I can't protect them from idiocy. Uh, maybe they didn't know, maybe they're trying to hurt me, but uh, you're trying to hurt somebody, you better be careful. God don't like ugly. You know, so it, it doesn't really bother me unless I let it bother me. My wife is always telling me, Tommy, do, do what you think is best for what you're doing. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, I, I'm not a, a magician. Even magicians lie. You, know, you got to watch what you're doing. Just, just be your inside showing out. Okay? Okay? That's the synopsis of, of a literary portion I heard before. Be yourself from the inside and showing out to the outside. And being proud enough to back it up and smile and strut on down the road. You'll make it. You'll make it somehow. Good. Dead face. We have time for one more question. There's a little one right there. <clears throat> Thank you. One of our young attendees. Yeah. Not sure I'm going to say this right, but um, what made you want to write? I personally, or personally, love to write things. Uh, I recently rewrote uh, a story that I had for a class, and I wanted to do my own characters, um, do my own setting and stuff. Um, I might not have done the correct or spelled spelled words correctly or did the right <laughs> punctuation but um i <laughs> love to write and i think it, it expire it inspires me that uh uh that uh that that you're feeling fine you're feeling fine yeah that's right that uh that someone's words can that someone's words can inspire you to write something listen uh, um I, I i've been writing i've been published since 2000 
forward. So I was like, one of these days, a kid that I met in a school visit, a presentation, is going to come up to me, and they've won more awards than me. They On the New York Times themselves, they hey, this might be you one day. And so uh, I'm going to tell you, read everything you, you, you get your hands on and really try to focus on your own individual voice. Like, the world needs your voice. Because there's plenty of other uh, authors out here that are saying what they need to say and telling the stories they need to tell, but the world needs your story. So just you know, continue to work on that. I, I started writing in the fifth grade. I was 10 years old. And um, uh, I really didn't read a lot growing up. I'm, I'm a huge music fan. So I used to read the liner notes on, on albums, like all the song lyrics were on it. So I used to copy down Stevie Wonder lyrics, um, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Roberta Flack, first woman I ever fell in love with. And, and then I fell in love with hip hop music. And, and my teacher, Michelle, in the fifth grade, recognized that me and my friends were into hip hop. So she introduced us to the writers in uh, you know, the Harlem Renaissance, the 1920s. So Langston Hughes is one of my homeboys. He's from Missouri. <laughs> I fell in love with his work. And, and through his work, I learned about uh, you know, character development, dialogue. So really, like, study the greats. Like, 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 study the writers that you really look up to and really um, you know, check out the literary devices that they use and how they use their own voices and, and, and just in the whole journey of figuring out what you want to say. Uh, you know, uh, again, the world needs your voice and I'm looking forward to come to one of your book signings one day. I'll yeah. be there. Yeah. 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 Let me know when your book is done. independent and we have to support black owned book sellers because our big box stores aren't doing these kinds of community events and I'm a big fan. One of the best gifts my husband gave me was a big gift certificate Christmas. Big, big gift certificate that I blew through in like a month. But um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, and we, we absolutely love you. I, we, tr we travel very far to come to you and where we live doesn't have a black bookstore. And um, so thank you for all that you do you and your husband and your daughter, all that you do. It's, it's not, you don't just sell books. Mm -hmm. It's beyond that. Like the books, again, it's, that's just the avenue that you do to create community, to get stories out. The events you put on are phenomenal. And if you guys aren't following them, if you haven't shopped there, right. do yourself right. a favor. You'll thank me later, but. Thank I'm you. thanking you now. Yeah. I'm bring you up to the. <laughs> no, I have okay. to say one thing, because they won't say this. All right, we just moved to Winter Park, Florida. They flew up from Florida today to be here for this, and they're flying back tomorrow so she can get to school. Wow. Okay. So just want to let you know how serious, when she says how serious she means by that, she loves my homie, my book. Thank book. So. you. Thank you for that. That means a lot. And not just for me, but other independent booksellers that are around the country that I'm in contact with who are going through the ups and downs and the support that we get from people like you to fly here from Florida. I know you can't even see Dr. Smith, <laughs> but it's just, it's just humbling that to see people be excited about books, to be honest, to be excited about books and to have a young person here who's excited about writing. I can't wait to have your book in our bookstore. Um, but yeah, thank you for, thank you, thank you for that. All right, so thank you all. We will stand and take a photo if you wanna take a photo of us. I'll, let, I'll do one with, and then I'll let the three, the trifecta do one um, as well. But thank you all for coming. Thank you to the Library of Congress for hosting this event. Yes. Let's give it up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Follow them on all Instagram, on all social media at the Library of Congress. But thank you all, have a great night. Thank you. Fantastic.